Um, the chair notes the time is six o'clock. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge, a ZBA chair. I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with a roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Ms. Tammy Parks. Here. Mr. Dylan Maxfield. Here. Mr. Craig Meadows. Here. Mr. John Gilbert. Present. A quorum is present. I want to note the presence of a of our new associate member, uh, Mr. David Sloviter. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you. We look forward, we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Um, and, and Jordan Heltzer un, told us he was not going to be able to attend tonight. So um, we'll greet him the next time. Also attending tonight's public hearing is Christine Brestrup, planning director, and Mr. Stephen McCarthy, planner for the town. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the, pro access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of, of Massachusetts General Law, Chapters 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarifications or additional information. After the board has completed its question, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address for the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels that it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of the filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an aggravated party, for, excuse me, not an aggravated, an aggrieved party, potentially aggravated, but an aggrieved party to uh, contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, a public meeting, presentation and discussion on zoning amendments, um, proposed zoning amendments, Article 3, use regulation, duplexes, townhouse, converted dwellings, um, and presentations by um, councillors Mandy Johanneke and Pat DeAngelis, um, followed by general discussion, followed by discussion. Uh, those concern zoning bylaws, Article 3, use regulations, Article 4, Development Methods, Article 9, Non-Conforming Lots, Uses, Structures, and Article 12 Definitions. Following that, there will be general public comment period on matters not before the board tonight and other business not anticipated within the past 48 hours. So our first order of business is um, proposed zoning amendments. Um, we should, uh, we've invited uh, Councillors Haneke and DeAngelis to be with us. Um, and I don't see, I don't see participants. I don't see that they are here. 
Oh, Ms. Brestra. So um, I'm not sure that Mandy Jo Haneke knew that this meeting started at 6 because she has another meeting that's started at 4.30 and is going till 6.30. I'm just going to text her and um, see what her plan is for attending this meeting. And um, here I go to text her. Okay. Too many meetings. That is, I think that's the state of people involved in town government is too many meetings. It takes a lot, it, there are a lot of meetings. I'm asking her if she will be here around 630. All right, we'll just hold for a second and hold the meeting in abeyance for a few minutes. Yeah, I just sent her the, um, I just sent her that text. So um, you can talk about what you saw, what you heard from me last time, which was last Thursday, if you want to, if you want to start talking about it. And if you want um, Steve McCarthy to bring up parts of that. Um, he can do that while we're waiting to uh, hear back from Mandy. Would that be helpful or? Yeah, think? well, you know, I, I think it could be helpful, but let's see what she says. Um, it may come in if she responds quickly. I, I think in the meantime, we do have something we can do, which is to um, welcome Mr. Slobiter to the board. Uh, one of the things that we did last week when you were we're not there as we talked a little bit about the, the role of the board members and associate members in particular. And one of the things I just wanted to share with you is some of the thoughts that I had uh, expressed to the associate member that was there. And, and I'll summarize them and I won't go through it all, uh, David, but Ms. Parks. I just wanna say really quick, there's a question in the chat. Someone's asking about the procedures. I'm wondering if, if we should handle that. What is, I haven't seen that. What is the um, If you look in the Q&A, someone is asking about the Wilson property group, whether that's being continued. I, Shall I answer that? Yes, please. Um, yes. There, there was an error in the publication of the um, meeting notice. And so we have postponed the Wilson properties um, date to... March 23rd. That's the Canton Avenue project. We probably should have stated that. So we are going to re-advertise it in the newspaper. We're going to resend a butters notices and post it on the town website. But we apologize because um, the first time around, I think we neglected to um, publish the notice on the town website. 14 days in advance, which is required for a public hearing. So we've arranged with Mr. Wilson and with Tom Reedy, his attorney, to um, hold this meeting on the 23rd, and everyone will get another abutters notice, and there will be another legal ad in the paper. Okay, that was... Do you want me to write something in the chat about that? No, I think that it answered the, the, the person can only ask a chat, I think, if they're, uh, if they're an attendee, if I'm right. So I think that's right. There are other people here who are probably more familiar with Zoom, but I don't think you can chat without being on the Zoom. So, all right, um, David, I just, just a couple of things. First thing is, um, one of the things that I think is important for a, all members of the board is to understand the how significant it is when somebody appears before the ZBA. A lot of times it's their most important, they're talking about their most important asset, whether it's their home, their business, their neighborhood. And it's really important that we provide the impression and indeed do consider what they, they care about and what they're saying very, very seriously, that we give a great seriousness 
that it provides legitimacy for the ZBA and for the decisions we make is that the town understands it. So I take that, that's our most important role, is that at the end of the day, people believe that they had a fair shot, they were heard, they were listened to. These are things that are important to them and we have to realize that. So that's the first thing that I would say. The second thing is we try to be collegial as possible. And one of the ways we try to do that is first, if you get a chance, please try to read the stuff. Before, if you're on the panel, read the material beforehand. We try to get that to you several days ahead of time so that you can have time to look it over. It doesn't always happen, but that's our goal. And um, and it's been difficult with some people. We've been short staffed at the town right now, but they're struggling really hard. They're working really hard to try to get us information ahead of time. So that's something that, that is important for you. And lastly, try to be on the call at, um, you know, five or 10 minutes ahead of time if possible. 10 minutes ahead of time, just so we know everybody's there. We know what, that we have a, a quorum. Uh, it's the only time we can kind of um, say hello to each other and find out unofficially what's going on. Otherwise, we're, we're uh, in a meeting and we have to abide by the uh, uh, open meeting rule. And lastly, I would just say the last thing is that I really value, and I think everybody on this board values a, a very civil and collegial body. And so I, one thing I don't want to, I haven't seen very often, but I won't tolerate and I won't abide is uh, criticism and un, untoward language either towards each other or from the public towards the board. And that's really important. Now, we don't see that very often, but I think it's important that we not have that um, on the board. And so all those are the kinds of things that I like to, to um, introduce new members, uh, associate members to the board and, and remind them of that. And we've had a very good, I think, very collegial board. And I, intend, I expect it'll continue. And we look forward to that being the case with you. So if you have any questions uh, in the next few minutes uh, until we hear from the, um, from the count, town councilors, please um, ask them. It's the, it's the time to do that. I don't have any questions. I appreciate everything you just said, and I understand it, and everything makes sense. And I assure you of my compliance in both tone and content. So no problems, not from me at least. <laughs> That's good. So then you'll if, you're, if you're then aggravated, you won't be looking <laughs> to me, hopefully, as the source. I hope that I'm sure that's true. OK, and well, you're going to fit in just fine. That's Good. great. Good. Thank you. All right. I guess I would ask uh, if it's any other bits of information you want to provide to David or if just bits of advice. Otherwise, I had some comments I guess I could make about the um, matter we're going to have before us. Mr. Maxfield. I, I just want to say uh, hello, David. Great to uh, great to have you on the board, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. So do I. Thank you. Have um, Have you had a chance to review this outside of the last meeting? Have you had a chance to review the proposal? Has anybody had enough time? It's 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 an extensive piece of work. It's a lot, there's a lot of changes. There's a lot, there's a lot in this. Um, I've spent some time looking at it and I've listened to a few of the planning board meetings. Um, and so I've, I've spent some time on it. And I think it's, I think it is important for us to understand that what this means for the zoning board of appeals, but more importantly, what it means for permitting pathways in town. Um, Tammy, you were nodding your head. You had a chance to review it, right? I, I did. And, I'm mostly interested in um, in whether this in how this will solve the affordable housing crisis. So I'm very interested to hear uh, that part of it. Like what what are yeah. what are what are these changes um, going to address and solve? And so I'm interested in hearing that. Okay. Um. We have another chat from a request to turn on transcript. Stephen, do you know? I think it's been turned on. I see something okay. at the top of the page. Who can see this transcript? So, okay. Oh, yeah, I believe that enabled. should be enabled. If anybody cannot um, see that, you can let me know. All right. Good. Mr. Meadows, I think you've been you've been traveling, so you may not have had a chance to review it, but I'd I'd uh, I, re recommend I did, it to I, you. 
I did have an opportunity to review it. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, at this point in time, I find it. Um, <laughs> looking at the constant flow of requests that we get in to essentially uh, convert what used to be single family and double two, two family complexes here in town to student housing. Um, and if we, I, I think, avoid that responsibility by uh, suggesting that this document be enabled, um, I think we're doing a disservice to the town. I, 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 I think uh, Ira Brick's letter was uh, very appropriate that we are seeing an influx of student housing in town uh, that is driving people out of town. I've heard of someone else from my daughter today who said a friend of hers is planning on moving out because of the student uh, uh, the students overwhelming other people within her neighborhood. Uh, too many houses are being converted. And it is realistic to think that a house, if a house is converted, its costs are gonna go skyrocketing per apartment because they're gonna go to the highest possible bidder. And we're gonna get more and more people from uh, investor groups coming into town to buy up properties to convert them, particularly if they don't have to go to, through the ZBA. Those are my feelings at present. I'd like to hear if there's some rationale beyond that. But... Well, I really, I, I do want to give um, the, the proponents of this, the, the sponsors of this, a chance to make their case was to listen to it. Um, and I think there really, there are two questions. I see two questions, two buckets of questions. The first is what's the reason for the change? What in the special permit process needs to be, is a problem or needs to be revised or needs to be uh, abandoned in some cases. That's one thing. So those are sort of process questions and why the adjustments to the uh, permitting pathway are being made. That's one set. The second set is sort of housing policy and economic policy. What's going to be the effect of these changes? And and that's the, the things that you were speaking to there. I think those I think those are two things, both legitimate things for us to discuss. The first I think is core to the body uh, to us, um, and I think we can provide some in, some valuable information and insight as to the process, the permitting process that we currently use in special permits. The second is I think we all can have some opinion um, that's informed by our experience doing this job and working on being on this board for the last several years for some of us. So that's how I view this. And I wonder, Chris, have we heard back from Mandy? No, we haven't heard back from her. She still has another 11 minutes in her other meeting. Um, I, I didn't realize she may have told me that she was going to be late, but um, in my current state of being all things to all men, I have possibly missed um, an email from her or forgotten about it. So, um, well, let me just say one thing about um, the 23rd. Why don't we, when does that notice go out for the, for March 23rd? That goes out on the 3rd of, um, on the 3rd of March. We'll so let's talk, a, let's talk about that date um, before it goes out. Can we, you and I have a conversation about that? Yes, I have don't. I, I can't be there for that. Yeah. Oh, you can't yeah. be there for that. I cannot be there on that date. Is there? Uh, do you want to then postpone that? Um, I'm. You know, I'm not. I'm, I'm not familiar with the the project, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about. If if it's um, a long term project, I would. If if it's not going to be um, very complicated um, and it's not going to be several meetings and I think somebody else could we could have the meeting without me there we've got good people here that can handle the ZBA if I'm not here but if it's going to be several if it's complicated in several hearings then I would want to um, move it to a different date 
So that one I think may not be complicated. It depends on how many members of the public and abutters um, attend and have uh, comments. Um, my guess is it's not too complicated and the house is more or less in its original location, but it's been twisted um, a little bit and the driveway has been straightened. Um, so it's not very different from the one that was previously approved. Um, but there is another case coming up that night that would be a big case that's probably going to take multiple nights, and that would be 515 Sunderland Road, where there's a proposal to put in a bank of battery um, standalone, what they're calling BESS, Battery Energy Storage System, uh, which is large and um, there may be people who are very interested in that, and there may be a lot of questions from the ZBA. It's already gone through the Conservation Commission, but um, I suspect that there will be a lot of members of the public who will want to attend that meeting and um, possibly just to learn about these battery storage systems, mm -hmm. um, but also maybe to comment on it. So that probably should be moved to a night when you are available, Mr. Judge. All right. So let's see, then we'll, we'll continue the, we'll have the, the first item for the 23rd. Um, and our vice chair, uh, Mr. Max, you'll, you'll, you will chair that? Hello. Cool. Good. All right. And we'll, and we'll figure out a, a associate member to put in that position uh, to take my place. You and I'll talk, we'll talk about that, Chris, okay? Okay. Mr. Meadows, I thought I heard, oh, Ms. Ms. Parks. Um, uh, forgive my ignorance, but um, how, what is gonna happen with these amendments? Who, how, I know there's some forums to discuss them, some public forums, but how do they get voted on? I mean, are, so, yeah. Here, here's my understanding of them and, Chris, and Ms. Brestrup, you can tell me if I'm, if I've short circuited it. Pre, these have been proposed and given to the council. The council then referred it to the CRC committee, the Community Resources Committee, and the Planning Board. This, those two bodies are supposed to take a look at those and make recommendations back to the council as to what they believe the disposition of this proposal should be. A, approve, disapprove, amend, and approve, whatever. There's a timeline for them to have their have that start their first public hearings that's set by state law that timeline has them starting i think before the middle of march before march 15th so coming up next week or the week after i think there's going to be a public hearing in the planning board and then i think there'll be a public hearing in the, the community resources committee uh, and they were required i think they're required to report back Ms. breaststrip i don't remember i think they're required to report back to the council sometime um, on a date certain, are they not? Um, may I answer? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yep. Please. So, um, yes, the planning board is holding its public hearing. It's opening its public hearing on March 1st and the CRC is opening its public hearing on March 2nd. They'll both be held via zoom. Um, there is no deadline for, um, getting back. Um, the planning board and the CRC can continue their public hearings until they feel that they, have enough information to make a recommendation. And in fact, last year, I think there was a public hearing that was held open for about six months until um, the planning board finally made its decision about how it was going to recommend. Um, so th there, my, my guess is that there will be a couple of sessions of planning board public hearing just because this um, proposal is complicated and people have a lot to say about it and um, there are a lot of members of the public who are interested. So the planning board will hear a presentation on March 1st and then planning board members will have an opportunity to comment and then members of the public will. Um, there have already been two meetings with the planning board. Um, one, I'm trying to remember, Anyway, um, the planning board did hear a presentation from uh, Mandy Johanneke, um, and they had another chance to discuss it. I guess they heard a, um, 
uh, presentation a few weeks ago, and then they had a chance to discuss it on their own uh, with Mandy Jo there for a little while, but not as long as she had planned or we had thought she would be. Um, so they, they've talked about it twice, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But now they'll have a public hearing and they'll talk about it again. And the idea is that they would um, come up with a recommendation uh, that they would write up and pass on to the uh, town council um, as far as, you know, what does what does the planning board think should be done with this? And the planning board could say, we think it's great. Go ahead, pass it. The planning board could say, this really needs a lot of work, you know, bring it back to us and we'll work on it. Or the planning board could say, we like this part of it, but this part needs more work or we disagree with it. So they could come out with a, a number of different responses. But um, the process, I believe, will not end on March 1st. I think that there will be more discussion about it after that. Ms. Parks. Um, so I guess, um, so the town council has the final say on whether uh, these get passed after the recommendations of the planning board and the CRC? Yes. So, that's right. uh, so if if members of the ZBA want to have input, um, do would they then attend these the planning board meetings and the CRC meetings and give input there? Or is there some other avenue of input from the zoning board? Um, First of all, we absolutely you can attend individually and as to, to any of those meetings and provide public comment because there will be public comment at it. This proposal has not been referred to us um, as, a, as a matter from the, the town. So we don't have anything in front of us. Tonight is really for us to try to understand the proposal and then give feedback to the sponsors of the proposal that could perhaps inform their, how they view it, maybe change it, but we don't have anything referred to us. Um, it is, I'm not sure that it makes sense, or it, I'm, I don't think it makes sense for us to take a position as a board on, a, on this because it's not before us as a, as a matter of referral. We're looking at it because it affects what we do, but we don't have jurisdiction over zoning changes. And I think in some case, in some ways, Ms. Parks, um, we are we are supposed to apply the zoning bylaw. We're not. Our job isn't to set the the policy. That's really the planning board and the town council. But I think that we should feel free to comment uh, individually. And I'm going to comment. I'm sure, certainly, as chairman of the of the recognizing that I'm chairman, but not in my role as chairman of the board of the of the zoning board of appeals. Now, if the board feels very differently and they want to make a statement. We can check and see if there's any legal inhibition, legal inhibition to do that or reason not to do it. But um, what I'm thinking now is we don't have it before us. We're just looking at this and informing ourselves. And so we can provide feedback to the people who have the decision making on this. May I say something? Yep, please, Chris. So, uh, anyone is welcome to send um, comments in writing to me. And I will pass them on to um, the the people who are sponsoring this, as well as to the planning board. So, if Ms. Parks would like to send comments in writing to me, she's welcome to do that, and any other ZBA member is welcome to do that. And I've also asked Stephen if he'd take um, some notes. I sent him an email and asked him if he'd take some notes just to jot down what people are are concerned about and the questions they asked. At the meeting to summarize them, not to it isn't a, a full minutes, but just so we know what issues were raised, and I, we can use that also as something that might be helpful to you, Chris, mm -hmm. to send to the planning board members uh, of the questions that are raised by members of the ZBA. I'm going to check my email and see if I've heard anything from Mandy Joe. No, I have not. I can call her in about five minutes. Okay. So, I, I you know I don't want to forget one bit of procedure that which we normally do when we open up discussion on a specific topic is that we cite the submissions that we've received, and I haven't done that yet, even though this is not 
a hearing, I, I think it's important to, for transparency to cite what we've, the submissions we have received. Those include a presentation from the counselor, from counselors Haneke and DeAngelis, and including a proposal, um, a, a sponsor statement, which was dated December, 2022. We also got an email from Mr. Ira Brick, um, dated the February 14th, 2023. I don't think we've received any other public comments or any other public letters or submissions uh, that I'm aware of. You did receive um, sheets of uh, text and a use table um, taken from the zoning bylaw that has been red marked. Um, I guess it's been, what do you call it, track changes. Um, so that yep. did uh, come along with the presentation, um, the PowerPoint presentation. There were extra sheets that showed specific changes that um, were being suggested. All right. That, well, I guess I thought that was part of the presentation, but yes, you're right. May we take up the any other business at this point since we, uh, rather than just waiting? You know, we, we, we just have um, Councillor Haneke just appeared. All right. So, um, thank you for uh, thank you for appearing. Thanks for taking the time to uh, to talk to us. Uh, you're busy. I know you had another meeting tonight, um, and we appreciate you taking the time to to review this with the members of the zoning board. This is an extensive. This is a really extensive proposal. It's lots of implications for us. Lots of implications for the town, uh, and I think it's important that we understand what you're proposing. I also think it's important that we give you some feedback on the concerns that we, questions we have, concerns we see. Um, and I am, and then at the end of our comments, I'll open it up for public hearing on the public comment on the proposal. But um, I really look forward to number one, hearing from you. And also number two, giving you the opportunity to hear from us, some of our the concerns that we may have about the proposal. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Councillor, to, um, to, to make a presentation. You've done this several times, I bet you've got it down. <laughs> but thank, you. thank you, Steve, um, for that. And I'm glad I could come in right when you were trying to figure it out. I came right from my community resources committee meeting. So um, sorry, I was late to your meeting, but that one didn't end until 631. Um, I, I have, you've seen the presentation. It's been in your packet for a while. I will try to go through it somewhat quickly. Um, quickly is like 15 minutes, but I'll try to make it even quicker than that, um, because I think you've heard from Chris last week about some of the, about what the proposal is. And so um, the goal here, I think for me, is to talk a little bit about what we're proposing, but not exactly what it is, but the reasons we're proposing some of it. Um, if if it would be possible, I don't know whether you want me to pull the presentation up on the screen or not. Um, if you do, I'm going to need permission to share my screen. Um, and if not, that now, Mandy. Excellent. Thank I, you, Steve. I think that'd be helpful. Yep. Um, That's helpful. So, yeah. so there we are. Um, I'm going to try and go through it quickly because I know it's a lot of slides. Um, but I'll spend a little bit of time on this one because this is what really drove Pat and I, and, and I am a co-sponsor with Pat DeAngelis who cannot come to the meeting. Um, Pat is dealing with a recovery of a health issue that limits how many meetings she can attend. Um, and she was just in a two hour meeting with me somewhere else. So, um, but we are co-sponsoring this and, and we approached our proposal thinking about um, the comprehensive housing policy that the council passed um, and just our housing crisis in town. Um, we all recognize we don't have enough housing and we all recognize we have expensive housing, both rental and homeownership type housing. Um, we know we've been building a lot of apartment complexes. Um, single family homes are also regularly built and, and occasionally we get other things, particularly in the converted dwelling area with buildings that are all that already exist. We've also had recently some townhomes 
um, get permitted, as you know, and then a number of affordable uh, housing projects. But it's not enough in terms of to bring prices down or to provide the amount of housing for the people who want to live here. And so one of our approaches was if we don't change something, we're never going to get ourselves out of the housing crisis. Doing nothing won't help. And so what can we do? What can we propose that would encourage more housing opportunities from a zoning perspective? And, and the key word is encourage. We don't know what would actually happen, right? We can't speculate by changing from a special permit to a site plan review, will more housing be built? We can only say that streamlines a process, it might result in more housing. And so we're trying to encourage it. Um, we want to address some of this demand by adding the supply. Um, we thought about equity in housing. There's a long history that zoning is enacted to exclude people from certain areas of places. This is not just an Amherst thing. It is a nationwide thing as to why zoning has been enacted. And so we want to eliminate some of that exclusionary policy in our town, particularly as it relates to the only type of building actually that can be built um, in town without going through a public hearing as a single family home. And we would like to expand that to eliminate what we consider that as single family only zoning um, and add in duplexes, certain duplexes, not all duplexes into that ability to build a, a building without going through the permit, the public hearing permitting process. You still need the building permit and you still have to abide by zoning. Um, so one of the purposes of our proposal is to treat owner-occupied duplexes and in, in most senses, affordable duplexes, the same as single family homes. We believe it would help eliminate economic and social segregation. Um, single family only zoning means there are neighborhoods and portions of town that you only see single family homes. Um, because others aren't allowed or they're too hard to build. Um, and we want to fix that um, and fix it, meaning we want to address that and say we want through the housing policy, we want we want neighborhoods that have economic diversity. We want neighborhoods that have um, social not that aren't socially segregated amongst different groups. And when you only have single family homes, in a neighborhood, you're more likely to have that economic segregation. And so opening up permitting pathways, we hope will help eliminate it or help address some of that. Um, multifamily housing is more sustainable than single family housing. So if we build multifamily housing on lot, we create a little bit and improve a little bit on the sustainability. And then we were just looking at the use table in general, and there were some permitting pathways that didn't that didn't seem logical to us. And so we tried to look at the use table in a logical manner, meaning, you know, if if a apartment complex is permitted in a RG zone or an RVC zone by site plan review, and I'm not saying it is right now, but if it were, so and I don't think it is, but but I'm just trying to give an example. If it were to say, well, a townhome is is a better use in that area than a apartment complex potentially because of the medium density zoning. Why would we require that as a special permit? You know, and so so we asked some of those questions when we saw things that required a higher level of permitting than something else that we thought was a more intense use, or that something we thought was a less intense use, depending on the zone we were looking at. Um, and I can point some of those out as to some of the things we looked at as I go through. But those were some of the things we brought to this. I'm going to skip the permitting systems other than to say, as you know, your what you deal with in ZBA, the special permit, is a discretionary permit. You can say no. And you have a lot of discretion on whether to say no. You're looking at not just the zoning bylaw, but you're looking at the zoning map and saying, is this use appropriate and suitable for the location in the zone it is being proposed to be built. Site plan review is a, considered a by right. It recognizes that um, that use is suitable in all areas of the zone it is 
per, it is allowed in. Um, and so that's that's how we approached this is, is a duplex, is a triplex, is a townhome, a suitable use in X zone? Um, or is it a use that is only suitable in parts of Y zone? Um, and those are the questions we asked. Um, this was set in as a reminder of what density means and what our residential zones do. We ran into a problem in looking at this and proposing this because RO and RLD are in the same column. And so I just wanted to point that out that, you know, we recognize RO and RLD are completely different zones and have completely different density and intentions, but they're in the same column. And so when we thought a use was appropriate for portions of an RO, we needed to allow at least a special permit. Um, even if had they been in separate columns, we would have said no to the RLD. But because they're in the same columns, it it and it relies on you as a ZBA to to really use that discretion on use in certain areas of the town. Duplexes. Um, basically, what we there's some pictures of some duplexes, and there are three categories in the zoning bylaw: owner occupied, non-owner occupied, and affordable. And as I said earlier, we looked and we believe that in all of our residential zones. RLD through to the RG, our lowest density to our highest density, that a duplex is suitable. Whether it's owner occupied or non owner occupied, we're proposing a yes, a permitting pathway that does not require public hearing for only non owner occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes. We are requiring, we are proposing the site plan review for non owner occupied duplexes, but we approached it and said, duplexes are suitable in our residential zones, in all areas of our residential zones. Um, we've got the dimensional table to limit the density there, but a duplex is a suitable use in all of our residential zones, low density to high density. And with that, I'm gonna page through the duplexes to triplexes. This is a new category um, right now, if you want to put a three dwelling unit on a property, you're either a townhome, a townhouse, or an apartment complex. And we thought three, th three dwelling units should not be treated as apartment complexes. And so we're proposing a new use category. Um, we've gotten questions as to why it has to be vertically. We chose not to propose a change to the townhome definition, townhouse definition that is three to 10 units side by side. And so that's why we've proposed only vertically. We are willing to go back on that consideration and maybe change the proposal for townhomes to be four to 10 so that all three family, three unit dwellings would be considered a triplex. Um, and when we looked at this one, <clears throat> excuse me, the new category we had to propose all zoning districts. And so in the, what I call the commercial sort of zones, um, we've proposed the same as every residential use except hostel and congregate housing, which is a no. In the business zones, we believe they match, triplexes match most closely to duplexes, and therefore we propose the same pathway as the non-owner occupied duplexes, which we're proposing to change to site plan review and then not allowed in the other more dense business zones. In the residential zones, again, we believed it was close to the duplex category, and so we proposed the site plan review. Conditions for both the duplexes and the triplexes in our proposal match mostly the conditions of the ADU bylaw that we just modified as a town council about a year and a half ago when we made ADU's accessory dwelling units um, permissible without a public hearing at all with just a building commission or building permit grant. Um, so, but, but it's not, it, it's an accessory use, so it doesn't show up on the use table, but we matched the conditions that went into that bylaw when we made that change for triplexes and duplexes. Um, adding a new use category means we wanted to, we looked at all of the rest of the zoning bylaw to see where duplexes were mentioned. As I said, we thought duplexes were most closely related to uh, triplexes are most closely related to duplexes, and in some of these section four um, development methods, duplexes were listed as permitted uses, and so we add, we're proposing to add the triplexes to those uses. 
Townhouses are, as I said, three to 10 units, private entrances on the ground level. And basically what we're trying to do here is in the business areas, um, say that they're appropriate in the less dense business areas, those sort of transitional business areas, the business limited, business fee, village center and neighborhood. So moving from special permit to site plan review. Um, and recognizing that in the business general area, they might not actually always be suitable and appropriate. We want our business general, our densest business district to house businesses, not housing in general. And so we're proposing to do the same thing the council just did to apartments approximately a year and a half ago, which was change apartments in the BG from site plan review to special permit. And so we're proposing sort of that downzoning there almost for the townhouse in the BG, but recognizing that in the more transitional business zones, a townhouse is, is suitable in those areas. In the residential, our medium to high density residentials, our village center and RGs, the ones next to all of those commercial areas, we're proposing a site plan review for the same reason. In the RN neighborhood, um, this was an interesting one that I spend a little time on. It, it Townhomes aren't allowed right now in the zoning bylaw in the RN neighborhood. You'll notice that I highlighted in pink, apartments aren't allowed in the RN neighborhoods. But as you saw in this presentation, our RN neighborhood has most of our apartment buildings. And so we weren't necessarily completely looking at just the use table here. We were looking at what's on the ground in the RN. And on the ground is a whole lot of apartment buildings. And if we have a lot of apartment buildings, a townhome is a nice transition from apartment building areas to non-apartment building areas. And so we wanted to allow them um, and give you the ZBA the discretion in allowing them in certain parts of that RN neighborhood, RN zone. Probably nearest the apartment complexes that already exist. But that means we had to take it away from not allowed at all into that special permit range. And same with the RO RLD district. This is one where if the RLD district had been a separate column, we might have left it a no, but it's combined with the RO district. And there are parts of our RO district that border village centers, particularly the one on this slide. And we believe that if you're going to be walkable to a village center, which this neighborhood is, um, a townhouse is appropriate. And so again, moving from that not allowed to that special permit to give you the discretion to say, yes, in this area, a townhome is appropriate. No, in that area, it's not. We're going to deny that permit is, in our opinion, a much better way to um, create the potential for housing in appropriate areas than to not allow it at all. The conditions we're not proposing changing at all other than the language. For converted dwellings, um, it's good to remember that this is a building that already exists. When we're talking about converted dwellings, we're talking about a building that already exists and that in the residential areas, you can't add up to more than four, you can't have more than four dwelling units in a converted dwelling and uh, no more than six in the business areas. And you can't add a residential dwelling unit solely by building new using this use category. And so, we believe that this is a, a use category that really achieves what our master plan wants us to achieve, which is infill development. You're adding density where buildings already exist, where residential buildings already exist, and you're not adding a lot of new lot coverage to do that. Um, the bylaw limits how much new lot coverage you can add and how much new construction you can have. And so this is a a use category we think we should really preference, um, which is why we've proposed to change it to site plan review in all of the in all of the zoning districts. Um, the conditions, if you've got questions about them, I can talk a little bit more about why we made the changes we did. The ARP is this blue hashed zone down south to protect our swamp aquifer aquifer. Um, our water supply. And so this is where the parentheses come in in the RN and RO and RLD districts. And basically we're proposing site plan, no less than a site plan review in any of the districts because we believe a, a public hearing and a board should look at all of the proposals there. 
to ensure that we are protecting the the water supply and then for convert for townhomes specifically um, and converted dwellings we recognize that those can be larger you know converted dwellings in these areas can go up to four units instead of three and townhouses could be up to 10 units um, and so for converted dwellings, we're saying, you know, you need that special permit. We need to be in front of you, the ZBA. And for townhouses right now, we've proposed not allowing them. Um, I just came from a conversation at the Community Resources Committee where people were questioning the no as to maybe it should be a special permit because, you know, for one reason in converted dwellings, we've moved a lot of um, some of our neighborhoods to public sewer. Um, and public sewer is one of the most important things to protect the aquifer. And so maybe a special permit for townhomes in these areas is also appropriate, as long as we have that sewer requirement in there and all. Um, so we'd be willing to consider that. The only thing I have to say about subdividable dwellings is that Rob Moore, our building commissioner, when we proposed, when we talked to him about this proposal before we made it formal, said, let's delete it because it's only been used once. So I can't talk much more about it beyond that, but we went with his recommendation. So I wanna say thank you so much and I am looking forward to hearing your comments and questions. Great, thank you. Um, you know, this this is clearly a, this is a, a very extensive proposal and it's, a, it's very logically built. I mean, you, you build on a foundation and you move from one use to another and you try to, I think you try to make an effort to to um, connect all the different uses by um, sequentially across different um, residential buildings. So if it, if there's a special permit one place ex in existence and you move to site plan review, you try to do that throughout the, the course, moving a step up, shall we say, in the pathways and the, the permitting pathways. But one thing that strikes me is that this proposal really takes, uh, this proposal really does reduce the amount of special permits and with it, that as a pathway. And I'm wondering what it is in the special permit process that you feel is inappropriate for our, the small, I'll call them small residential uses, the, uh, the duplexes and triplexes and the owner occupied um, duplexes. We do a lot of that now, and I wonder, I'm wondering uh, what is it in the special permit process that causes you to believe that that is unworkable for these smaller residential buildings? So it's, if I may. Yeah, um, please, please. You know, it's, it's not necessarily that we believe the special permit process is unworkable or um, is particularly problematic on a general scale. Um, it goes back to a special permit is discretionary, a site plan review is not technically, is technically a by right use. And so um, from an outsider looking in or someone looking in and saying, what does this town of Amherst want to build or want to allow to build when they see a special permit on the use table, they say, oh, they don't really think it's entirely suitable in that zone. Maybe they don't want it. It makes it a little less um, sure that that the permit will be granted. I know you grant a lot, but I also know that there are um, applicants that withdraw their applications after months and dollars and all because they've determined you won't grant it. Um, whether or not that's an appropriate decision or not, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to comment on, but the grant percentage, I would say, is not always accurate as to how many applications are actually granted. Um, but, you know, what, what I would say is, so, so part of it is what message are we sending to the community when we say a duplex needs a special permit in the RG, our most dense, the, supposed to be the densest residential zone? What we're saying is, well, duplexes, we're not really sure we want duplexes in our RG. Versus when we say site plan review, we're saying we want duplexes in our RG. And so part of it is that, um, you know, we have heard from Chris that the timing and the length of permit, the length of time it takes to move an application through the ZBA versus the planning board is not necessarily different. Um, we have heard from others that it is. Um, and the 
when you're looking at trying to create housing that is a little more affordable, um, trying to lower housing costs, the length of time you spend in a process contributes to the costs of housing. Um, and so if there are differences, which like I said, we've heard some people say there aren't and some people say there are in terms of the timing and costs of the two systems. If there are, the site plan review system is cheaper and that would potentially result in less costly housing. So the, if, to summarize, I mean, I think what you just said is that some people believe that the special permit is discouraging people from wanting to build a, uh, or um, expand the house in Amherst. That's one thing. And that it may take longer to do that under a special permit than a site plan review. And that's, that, that seems to me, so, so if I'm right, you, what you, what I think I hear you saying is that this facility, this movement to site plan review facilitates um, an ease of building new houses or expanding residence and um, over the site plan review, over the special permit. Yes, right? that's, that's really goal. what it is. But you know, Councillor Haneke, I I've looked. I, I think that is a there's an impression there that I don't know is true for in a couple of things, and I would ask you to think about this. The first is that the site plan review is by right. The site plan review have, in, the, in the bylaw, site plan review has, the, the planning board has three options. They can approve it, they can disapprove it, or they can approve it with conditions. I mean, that isn't by right. They do have the, they have the ability to disapprove something. And it's not only because they didn't have the enough information, they can disapprove it because it didn't meet the requirements of section 11.2 which is their section, which is the equivalent of ours 10.38. So they have that ability. I mean, maybe maybe what's happened is that the, um, the culture has been that site plan review moves more quickly because of the people on the planning board or historically a reason that there, but they, they, are, they are not by right. And they do have that same discretion that we have to, to, dis, to um, decline an offer to, or to condition it and it can be based on the application not being sufficient or that they didn't meet the 11.2 so i think that's i think that's an impression that may not be accurate in terms of the, the differences and i think that we've worked pretty hard to, to try to facilitate the um, ease with which people can come before the, the zoning board of appeals and and we've tried our very best to have that be as smooth a process as possible sometimes it just takes a while and it's because it's complicated. But I, I guess, is, do you have any response to that, to the, the, the differences there, I think maybe um, may not be statutory, but they may be impressions. So in all of my research and by what I've read at state law, including the housing choice legislation, a site plan review is considered a by right use. Um, you know, and there are much more limited reasons a planning board can deny a permit than a ZBA. I looked at section 11.2 and then the equivalent, I don't know what number it is for you guys, um, but I actually, in, in making these slides, I read those closely and you have a lot more things you can look at than the planning board can look at. They're not, you know, they, they might seem slightly equivalent, but they're not identical in what things can be considered. And so, so under state law, an SPR is a by right use, despite that limited amount of ability to deny. And a special permit is considered a discretionary permit that doesn't have to be granted. Um, and, and one of those big differences is suitability of location. A site plan review, I believe, I, I don't have the zoning bylaw directly in front of me right now, but I believe this, the, planning board does not look at suitability of location in determining whether to grant a site plan review or not. And one of your first things to look at is suitability of location. Um, I might be using the wrong words, but but that one wasn't in, from my memory, the planning board side, um, as, as distinct as it was in the ZBA side. Um, because a site plan review is considered already suitable for that. That use is already considered 
suitable for that location by definition. Um, and that's one of the biggest differences between the two and what Pat and I in considering where we were going to propose changes really considered. Is a duplex always a suitable use in the RG or in the RN? Um, or is it not always suitable? And in asking that question, we we concluded it was always suitable. People may not agree with us. Um, mm -hmm. But but that's okay. I appreciate that. Um, I have other questions, but I want to make sure that everybody on the board has a chance to ask questions. So I'm going to just run through uh, each member and let them do it, and I'll, I'll come back with more questions myself. Ms. Parks, do you have a question? Um, I guess I'm just tr trying to figure out how um, allowing a, a duplex makes it more affordable. Because in my mind, when you say you can, you know, will make a duplex uh, easier for an owner, I understand it's more affordable for the owner to own their property. But for the uh, most likely for students who are moving in for $1,000 a month, that space now becomes that cost. And so the housing in Amherst is so extremely high because of the student cost. Because if you put four people in one spot, that's that's four times more than if you put one family. So I don't see how that makes that affects affordability for people who would like to live in Amherst who are not students. So it, it's hard to describe. Um, and, and we don't know whether it would immediately affect affordability, right? Um, part of affordability is supply versus demand. The more supply you have to address the demand in theory, some in in theory in economic theory the 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 less caught the the less high rent you can charge or or purchase price you can charge but if you're looking at a duplex versus say a single family home if a builder builds if a builder buys a plot of land for two hundred thousand dollars or one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and can only build one house on that plot of land they have to recover that cost with just one unit of dwelling units, say they're gonna sell it. They have to, if they build it and sell it, they can sell it to exactly one person who has to be able to with, or one family or one set of units, right? Um, who have to be able to pay all of those costs. If you can build two units on that piece of land, that land cost has now been split in half. Half in, in if you think about it like that, the land cost is now distributed over more dwelling units. And so, it's, it can be slightly cheaper. We have examples of friends um, who go in together to buy a plot of land and build a duplex and one set lives on one side, one set lives on the other, or one lives down, one lives up, and they've gone together as friends and they would never have been able to buy that on their own without sharing those costs. So now they have their own units, their own living spaces that they can own and live in that they couldn't have done with a single family home. A, an owner occupied duplex that might rent out one side um, might be able to only afford to buy that piece of property, that parcel because it is a duplex and they have the ability to rent one dwelling unit while living in the other. Um, so it's, it's, not as, as, it's not an easy solution and it's not an obvious solution, but that, that's where we're coming from. I, I understand that point of view. I just don't think that it's it makes housing in Amherst more affordable because anyone who has a duplex, if you have a choice of renting to a family or four students, you're going to rent to four students because you're going to get three times more money or four times more, more income from that. And so it's for my son, who's not a student, who's looking for an apartment to move into, there is nothing available that's less than two to four thousand dollars. A one bedroom apartment is more than two thousand dollars here, yeah. because that one bedroom apartment can have four people in it. He doesn't want to live with four people. So I'm just that. That's my concern about the affordability of Amherst. I don't see that that this is will make a difference towards that. I think it will actually not help that. All uh right. Ms. Parks, uh, should I move on to, Ms. to Mr. Maxfield? Mr. Maxfield, do you have a question? 
or a comment? Um, I, a couple comments, a couple, I guess a question. Um, I mean, my first comment is, yeah, I mean, I'm no, uh, I'm no economist, uh, economist here, so I can't say how this is going to impact it, but uh, I think the general idea of new things that are going to be built are certainly going to be more expensive, but usually as you have more supply, that's going to make what already exists here cheaper. Um, my only real concern, uh, and I serve over on the board of licensing as well, and, and maybe this is as part of that is, is addressing that concern, is I have lived in, in some of the student housing, the off-campus student housing, and there are just an absolute a large amount of slums, just absolute dumps that uh, I think landlords who really should have no business being landlords are coming to somewhere like Amherst where you know you can, as it currently stands, buy a single family home, convert it into um, rental units and just, just pack people in there. Um, that's already a problem. The one thing I, you know, I worry is can this expand that, that you can have um, you know, even more of a financial incentive for these people to, to come here and, and try to make more money on that? And I think, it, it, I guess if I'm understanding this, the, the idea of we're, we're looking to address that with, um, what are we calling it, the, the rental registration bylaws is, is trying to address that problem. Am I correct about that? Yes, and that's what I was gonna say. Um, the taking care of a house, a, a rental in particular, um, Pat and I don't believe belongs within the zoning, um, that that belongs within a rental permitting system. And CRC has been working for over a year to revamp our rental permitting system. Um, and one of the biggest changes will be when it finally gets out of committee and into the council for debate um, at the support and request of our building inspector that the inspections department inspect be the inspector, no more self-inspections of any rental units, that the building department becomes the inspector and inspects and that the units have to pass the inspection before they can rent their building or their unit. And so that, that I, Pat and I would argue as sponsors that that's the avenue to deal with the concern about habitability um, and upkeep and all of that, not the zoning bylaw. All right, Mr. Maxfield, any other questions? I'm good right now. I'll give, I'll give yeah. other members a chance. Uh, Mr. Meadows, do you have a question? Well, I, I'm not so certain that it's a question. I think it's more a comment. to this point. I definitely have a comment. Uh, I, I, I agree with what Pat was saying. I, uh, I, I think you're well-intentioned, but your, but your methodology is, is, is totally incorrect. I don't believe that allowing uh, allowing a permit by site plan review is going to cause any afford affordability in town. What it's going to do is raise prices for those that are here now, particularly the students. It's going to increase the student population. It's going to drive homeowners out of town who are uh, very displeased with the influx of students into their neighborhoods. It's going to push uh, more duplexes and triplexes into areas that don't have them now. And consequently, students will be four to an apartment, four to a, a duplex, uh, excuse me, eight to a duplex, 12 to a triplex. The uh, building commissioner has not got enough time now to look at what is already there. There's no way that they're gonna be able to keep up as that progresses. And uh, we're gonna find our town, uh, a student town, which it is now, but, but with very, very few individuals who wanna live here and no one who is looking for affordable housing. Uh, good intentions, but not an appropriate means. Should I, do you want to respond or should I move on to the next person? Um, okay. it, Ms. Haneke. My response would be, we don't happen to agree. So, um, yes, that's <laughs> <you know. laughs> 
Mr. Gilbert, do you have a uh, question or comment? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll make some quick comments. Uh, I appreciate all the work that, you know, you guys have done. Um, this is, it's a big undertaking and it's a complicated nut to crack. There's not really one, uh, I think, clear cut solution. Looking at, you know, the zoning is, um, it's tough, and, but you, you've done a great job here. Um, I, I think, you know, I mean, from, from what I've seen presented in, you know, from sort of like paging through the packet to, to sort of let some of it sink in a little bit. Um, I, I mean, I do think that there's some aspects of what you're proposing that, that do work um, actually quite well. Um, but, but I do think that some of the comments that we're hearing um, you know, for example, from Mr. Meadows here, um, you know, I, I almost do believe that there is maybe a middle ground between some of what is being proposed on, you know, uh, a pretty heavy handed um, transition, let's say, from, from ZBA to uh, site plan review. Um, you know, maybe it's just some of the use cases, um, you know, uh, don't, aren't, aren't allowed to sort of um, off ramp. Uh, uh, but but with that being said, I mean, I, I do the intention is certainly, um, you know, well received. And, you know, I mean, yeah, basic economics, you know, supply and demand. I, I hear all that. I mean, you know, I personally work in affordable housing and um, there's, you know, there's an enormous need for that out here. Amherst, however, I mean, the market is it's it's students, right, as 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 everyone's kind of talking about. I mean, I personally believe that some of the requirements that you have in place with respect to, um, you know, homeowner occupancy um, with, with some of these like uh, upgrades, right? Let's say um, up, upgrades of, of current zoning without having to go through ZBA. Um, that makes complete sense to me. I don't see how anyone can really argue against that. If, if the homeowner is in play, you know, in, in house, um, you know, it comes down on them. It, it's not this, you know, argument of having, Third party private equity firms step in and scoop up our housing supply and, you know, drive all the Amherst locals out. That's that's not the case. But I do think that that fear comes from a place of understanding that, you know, when you start to open the doors a little bit, um, how wide you open them does, in fact, have some other, you know, um, more consequential impacts, let's say. And so, you know, there's, of course, two concerns. There's the concern of you know changing the demographic of um, of the town for you know the the long term residents and there's the need for housing right and I don't think those necessarily have to be mutually incompatible it's just a question of um, sort of how and when we loosen some of the um, let's say existing you know laws or laws or zoning laws basically um, in order to incentivize um, you know some increased housing stock. Um, you know, I mean, if students are living here, where are they live in, ha you know, Hadley, um, probably not very many in Belchertown, you know, the, the options are a little more limited. You go out to Northampton, it's even slightly more expensive in most cases. So, you know, I do think that there, um, I do think that there is an approach here that, you know, benefits, um, and takes, you know, awareness and stock of the, you know, of course, the constant concerns of the long-term um, residents of this town, the permanent residents, right, but also does allow, um, you know, for some increased housing stock, because it certainly is a problem. I mean, I happen to live in a, you know, or rent, you know, at this point in my career, but, you know, uh, a, a pretty nice place in downtown Amherst, and, you know, my landlady lives right in the rear, like, she she's uh, a separate unit technically, but her and her husband and her family live back there. And I mean, I'll be honest, she would much rather prefer to rent to, you know, me as I was a grad student when I entered here than, you know, um, for undergrads as, you know, sort of some of the, the, the commentary is going. But she lives here. Right. So, I mean, there, there's a point in time where when she had rented to those undergrad populations, um, you know, they were renting, knowing that their landlord is basically on site. So, you know, there's a sort of like policing effect in, in place. And I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is that the, um, you know, loosening some of these restrictions while still requiring a homeowner to be present, um, you know, in, in the property and allowing uh, additional rental um, sort of a, a streamline is, is a win in my, in my opinion. And, 
I don't, again, I don't think that loosening everything up is, is going to necessarily solve the problem. And I don't think that's the argument that you're trying to make, of course, you know, yourself. It's, it's, we'll see kind of what happens, but you know, that, that idea again, has to be cognizant of, um, of course, the long-term residents. And, and so when and where that application and loosening occurs, I think is uh, certainly a more appropriate, you know, uh, realm for, for conversation here. But with all that being said, again, thank you very much for your time and, um, you know, putting the effort into investigating this. And I think a lot of what you have done um, is actually uh, quite, you know, impactful in a positive way uh, for, for the town itself. Thank you. Mr. Sloboder, you have any comment? No, I actually have a question more than a comment. Okay. Yep. Uh, the first thing that you mentioned in your presentation was a reference to a housing crisis as a basis for this proposal. Can you explain about the demographic that your proposal is attempting to help and how it will result in more affordable housing, given that recent history seems to indicate that new residential units end up as student housing and do not result in providing affordable housing for lower income uh, residents or employees of the universities or any anyone else in the community other than students? So a housing production plan that was done a decade ago now, um, we, we probably need another one, indicated that we were, I believe, at least 1,600 units, dwelling units, shy of accommodating the desire and need and demand in Amherst at that time a decade ago. Um, I don't believe we've built those 1,600 units that were demanded or needed to supply the demand from a decade ago and the demand has just gotten worse. That's the housing crisis. The demand is not just from students. The demand is from people who want to live here, um, want to go to our schools here, our workers at the universities and the colleges and in town, um, our employees, our professors, our non-professors non employees, just staff. So the demand is there. If we don't build, we don't ever supply the demand. We don't ever, you know, um, yeah, we don't ever cut that demand down. We don't ever get closer to having enough housing for the number of people who want to live here. And I'm not saying, and I will be clear, I don't know um, what the appropriate a number of housing units for a town Amherst size are, right? What can our water supply, you know, supply, right? I don't know some of those answers, but the housing production plan made it very clear and our comprehensive housing policy that the town council adopted about a year and uh, almost about a year and a half ago now made it very clear we have a housing crisis because we are not providing enough housing for the number of people who want to live in town. So our proposal is trying to address that housing crisis. And as I said, that crisis isn't just with students, it's or those young people, it is with all demographics, it's with elderly, it's with seniors, it's with low income, it's with middle income, it's with everyone. Um, and so our proposal is, I, I, I talked a little bit of, in response to Tammy's question, Ms. Parks's question about, you know, what might it address? Well, part of it is to provide housing that people want. Um, all demographics want housing at various types of housing. You know, our comprehensive housing policy says we don't want neighborhoods that are segregated and, and segregation or the missing middle, well, it said we had this missing middle. We have apartments, we have single family homes. There are some areas of our town that have 
the stuff in the middle where our proposal sort of concentrates the requested revisions, right? The duplexes, the triplexes, the townhomes, the conversions of dwellings. Um, various demographics want that type of housing. We can't guess who will actually go into these because I'm not the builder. I'm I'm proposing to create um, to create the possibility that these types of housings will actually get built. You know, they don't get built very often in town, at least as compared to apartment complexes or single family homes. Um, when you look at the mass housing partnership list of um, what types of housing we have, we are woefully under housed in compared to or under supplied compared to the average town in the state with duplexes. We have about half of the percentage of duplexes that most towns do in this state, according to the Mass Housing Partnership. Um, this proposal is trying to build, create the possibility to build them. Will it help provide affordable housing or workforce housing? Hopefully, that's the goal, right? And that's one of the reasons, if you look at our duplexes in particular, that it's the affordable duplexes that must have at least one unit on the state housing inventory to do that. And the homeowner duplexes, <clears throat> right, the ones that would have a homeowner in one of those two units are the yeses, because those are the types of units and the types of buildings we want to build most, places that, that, that we hope would um, zoning doesn't con necessarily control who occupies a home, right? But we do have these three categories of duplexes and affordable state housing inventory, affordable duplexes cannot be occupied by students from what I've been told. And homeowner, homeowner occupied duplexes, as Mr. Gilbert just seemed to indicate, are more often than not at least half not occupied by students. If you're concerned about building housing that is not going to be occupied by students, those two sets of uses are the most likely beyond single family homes to not be occupied by students, if that's your concern. Um, I hope that kind of answers your question. A lot of this is just creating the pathway in hopes that things will be built. Well, if I can follow up, quickly with something. I'm not questioning whether or not there is a housing crisis. There may be, there may not be. I don't know. I'm asking how your proposal in, in loosening the ability of the Zoning Board of Appeals to, uh, to have uh, control over what is done, how will you, how will your proposal provide housing for the, or, or make it easier to provide housing for university employees, the elderly, the other people that you listed who are not students. The, the recent history seems to indicate that every time a, 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 a single residence is subdivided or anything else is built, it is snapped up by students at twelve to fourteen hundred dollars a bed per month. It's a very lucrative return for developers, and I'm I'm asking you know, basically who are you who are you trying to help here, and how is loosening the protection and oversight going to increase the availability of housing? for grad students, associate staff at the university, elderly, seniors who are downsizing. How, how is that going to work? Why is your proposal needed? I, I, I think I've tried to answer that. If we don't build housing, we're not providing housing. And okay. it's demonstrated that we don't have the housing for them. And so if we refuse, if, if the current zoning isn't providing that housing, we're trying to make it potentially uh, give it more potential to provide that housing by building more housing. We can't guarantee anything, but right now the zoning we have is not providing that housing. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Councilor Haneke, thank you again. First, I do want to want to stress one one last time. This is an incredibly long amount, of, hard amount of work. So you did a. I mean, this is a lot of work, and we appreciate that and respect it. Um, and thank you for the dedication to the town that you have. I mean, this is a lot of work. Um, but I do think there's some problem. I, I have a question and, and a, a comment about your response to Mr. Sloviter. I don't think that you've that this plan has yet to demonstrate that the reason that you don't have enough housing in town is because of the special permit process. I don't think that I don't think we've proven that yet. And I think that we've done and I think that's kind of what is the basis of the a lot of this um, proposal is that and I'm trying to be fair to it um, is that you don't need a special permit in places where the owner non owner occupied um, duplex is allowed you just said it's, it's, it's going to be by site plan review and we don't need to have the spe we don't need a special permit in that case we don't need the hearing we don't or the special permit hearing and that's e essentially what you're doing and I think I think what that does is really it, it I think I would like to inf to provide you with an alternative view of the special permit process, which I think would be, I hope would inform your view. I think there's a real benefit to the special permit process. I think, think that's especially true in more dense areas where a given structure can have a dramatic effect on people very close by. Um, and, and it can do that while still, and, and we can have a special permit process that tries to balance between the the, the desires of the owner and the, and the concerns of the of the community, and that's exactly what the special permit process tries to do. We bring the public into the discussion. We try to we we bring the town engineer, we bring the, the safety, uh, the police and and fire. We bring the concom in. We bring everybody that has to have an opinion or a, a thought about the project into the into the the discussion. We. We uh, so oftentimes see that the results are of that special permit process where you have public comment, you have a, um, a well thought out application, uh, and you've had a lot of staff time working with the, with the applicant, that you find that the special permit reveals concerns of the neighborhood that can be addressed by the, the applicant. And you also find that the concerns of the neighborhood sometimes are ameliorated by what they learned about the project, that they were wrong. I mean, we've, I've seen this time and time again in the six years that I've been on the board, that the special permit project process educates the community about what a fear that they had may not be valid, but it also helps the, the applicant to respond to, to those legitimate fears. And it creates legitimacy for the special permit process, it creates legitimacy for that building, and it doesn't inspire the kinds of concerns that I think we've heard from several people that this is just ramming a lot of people down the throats of the community from um, you know some private equity investor who wants to put 12 kids in a in a house next to your house. I mean that's that is a real concern on people's part, and I think the special permit itself, the process, really adds to resolving those. And we've seen that time and time again. We a great example of it I think is on Faring Avenue where that uh, 59 units were put in right at the corner of, of Faring and uh, Sunset. And it was a special permit process. And we worked with the developer, we worked with the, the community. It was, it, was a very, it was a give and take. It, 59 units took three hearings. I don't think that, I don't think that bankrupted uh, Mr. Roberts to do that. I think it was reasonable of the, cause it was a significant, a, a really significant um, development in that area. But I think people at the end of the at the end of the day felt the process was fair, felt the process heard their views, and Mr. Roberts and uh, thought I, I think the developer thought we treated them all fairly, and the and net result is we've got 59 units, uh, 59 beds, or 59 people that are going to be having a space to live right downtown across from a dorm in the UMass campus, and I think that's exactly and it doesn't have to just be done with large large. Um, large projects. The same thing happens when you want to take a, from a, a, a non-owner occupant wants to move a single family home to a duplex. We see that all the time. Or a single family home now to a triplex. We'll see that. And we go through the same process. And I think, I don't think that that process 
deters people from coming to town. I think in the long run, that process provides support for appropriate development in residential neighborhoods. And I, I, I don't think I, I hear that in the representations that you make, and that have been made about, I don't mean to personalize it, the representations that have been made about the special permit process. Um, Mr. Maxfield. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess I just actually had a little bit of a counterpoint there. Um, so I agree with, with a lot of what you said, but the, uh, the proposal that you were referring to on, on, on Fearing Street is something that, that I've certainly thought about where, you know, we're talking about somebody who, if you can hire, you know, Kuhn, Brittle Architect and, and uh, Bacon and Wilson to come in and represent you before this board, people who have a lot of experience before this board and other boards like ours in the area um, who are really able to give us everything we would we would possibly ask for before we can even ask for it. I, I think you see a very smooth, easy process um, in that regard. But I, I think at this board, we've also seen smaller developers, really kind of mom and pop people come to us and have a very difficult time um, for both them and, and ourselves and, and, and trying to navigate it. And I think we have seen, you know, members of this board have seen people come before us for, for months and then withdraw. And I think that has uh, to do with, I think, a little bit one of the nature of the ZBA. It's an all-volunteer board that does cycle through people and, and we do lose experience over time. And as I said before, you're going to have these... Uh, law firms or architect firms that can come before us that they retain their people their professional staff coming to, to to coming before us so i think i think in a lot of ways you you could see smaller developers being able to uh build these types of buildings i don't think i would ever be able to be somebody who could afford to uh come before a zba to uh try to build something like a duplex but under this, uh, you know, kind of maybe this might be a little bit anecdotal, but I know for myself and, and a lot of people of my generation, when it comes to the idea of home, home ownership, the only thing that even looks feasible is doing something like a duplex or a triplex or even a four unit home as the only way, only path to affordability seems to be if you are doing an owner occupied or you're renting out other units to pay for the mortgage. Otherwise, a, a, a single family home in some in Amherst is just completely out of reach for somebody like myself. It's it's renting or move, you know, 20 miles in either direction before I can get to affordability again. And is is this, uh, you know, this proposal that's being put forward going to be what what addresses and fixes these problems? I don't know, but I know what we have been doing hasn't been working. And I, I, I definitely, you know, I've been with the, the CBA now for almost three years. I like, I like the special permit process. I do think we treat people fairly, but at the end of the day, it is a bureaucratic process that does take some know-how and can be costly and cumbersome for a lot of people. And I feel like sometimes for people, we're able to handle simple requests pretty easily, but other times I feel like people can get bogged down in a process that they just don't understand that can end up being costly. And I don't know, I, I, I'm obviously speaking for myself here, but I, I think that I think that these changes are on the whole uh, good. I think that it will do a lot, of, a lot of good for the town. So I know we ultimately don't have any sort of vote. <laughs> We're just kind of giving feedback on this. But I mean, I don't know. My feedback on this is, for the most part, I, I, I really like this. I, I, think, I think it will. Um, I think narrowing where we're dealing with special permits, um, especially where it is going to be, uh, you know, non-owner occupied for profit duplexes, that should definitely come for the CBA. That is undoubtedly uh, some profit driven uh, enterprise that's trying to do that. There should be input for the public on something like that. But owner occupied duplexes, a site plan review, as, as far as you know, I'm concerned with something like that. I, I think that does make sense to move in that direction. I have. Oh, Mr. Meadows. 
I, I just wanted to, to cite an example uh, similar to what you were saying, uh, Steve. We, we had someone come to us on Pine Street who wanted to build um, and the neighbor feeling like the uh, student housing on that site was very objectionable, objectionable, got an attorney to try and move against it. But the ZBA was able to bring uh, the person who wanted the, the uh, permit and the neighbor together. The neighbor was also saying that if they, if they did have someone move in, they were gonna move out of town. And by the ZBA encouraging these people to talk with each other and reason with each other, they became satisfied with what was going to be happening in the, and the, the permit was, was granted and they were building something that was beneficial to, to the town and beneficial to them. This wouldn't happen by, a, we, we would have lost another, another uh, town member had this been on a, a site plan review only. And it, it, the special permit process was very valuable in this case. Without the special permit process, again, we lose people, we don't have affordable housing, and uh, it's going to be turned into even more of a student populated town. You know, one of the things that I, I think is important is that we often will condition a special permit, we'll approve a special permit with conditions. And those conditions always come from the, um, fi almost always come from the findings we have to make under 10.38, which are extensive. I mean, they're, and they're, um, and we'll talk, I, I do have a question about that, but the conditions that we, that we come up with a lot of times are first off a negotiation with the staff, with us, with the applicant, right? That's the first point. Okay, you got these concerns. What about what about parking? What about gatherings? What about um, amenities, et cetera, et cetera? That's the first thing. We have a public hearing. We hear from the from the community, and we find that I think the things, the kinds of conditions that we impose, all are they make sense in most cases. Um, we. Talk about gathering size. I think of exactly one of the things I would worry about if I lived in an area where there was going to be a non-owner occupied duplex or triplex down the street is how many people are they gonna have at any given time at a party, right? And that is not something that is considered in a site plan review necessarily. It could be, I think they have the discretion to do that, the, but it isn't typically done. Uh, it's done with us all the time. And the result of that is there's less, there is less opposition to those kinds of buildings because you don't have um, wild parties every Friday night. You have a limit on that. And it's not just done by the, and the homeowner, if he's a owner occupant, he doesn't wanna, he or she does not wanna have a large gathering all the time, but they do wanna have, but if you're an, um, a non-owner occupant or you're a, an investor, that really doesn't come to your, that doesn't, if, come to the fore of your thoughts. So those kinds of things, whether it's gathering size, the length of overnight stays, something that we have all, we all the time have limits on because often you, it's just used as you get two or four or six people in what should be one, two or three people in a bedroom. You have additional people in the bedroom. We just dealt with that last week where you had four people or eight people living in a four person, four person um, unit. And it happens all the time. And, this is a way that you deal with that is by limiting through the lease, limiting the, the um, length and the number of overnight stays. Parking is a problem. I used to live across the street from a large, a large uh, student place. And while they, they were able to handle some of the, car, the cars for the students, they were always parked out in front of the house. It became sometimes parked out in front of the driveway, especially on weekend nights. You come out and you couldn't get out of your driveway because your driveway was blocked because students were parking down there. And it, it, it just, it is a real issue. And so we deal with that. And you consent the homeowner, the applicant to enforce parking by having, uh, you know, a, a parking regime of some site with stickers and, and towing. Those are the kinds of things that we work on the kind of conditions that only are available through a special permit. Amenities, we did this 
in two of the three lat most recent ones, large ones we've had, we talked about gardens and barbecues and, and community amenities. Um, those are just a few of those. But the intention here is that we really want to try to find a way in which to, to satisfy the need for more housing, try to meet the needs of the neighborhood, which is part of what Amherst is, is a, is a community of people. And we're trying to find a way, and we, I think we do it pretty successfully, find a way to, to facilitate the housing that we need, but yet not disrupt the neighborhood too much in, um, unnecessarily. And, that, and I think that only gets done. I've only seen that be done in the, in the special permit process. I haven't seen that. I don't know that the, that the building commissioner can do it on his own. And I'm not sure that in the end, a really overworked uh, um, planning board, which is gonna have all the work that we do from residents imposed upon them, plus all the other work they do, is really gonna have the time to do this. And so I, I, that is a concern I have for, the, for this proposal and removing the special permit um, permitting process. Thank you. Um, it, if possible, I would ask if Chris is willing to talk about what types of conditions the planning board regularly puts on their, their site plan review grants, because I know the planning board regularly puts on a lot of the conditions, and I think many of them are the same things you just talked about. And they have experience and all, but Chris is probably much better able to describe that. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, yes. This question. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So the planning board does um, does have a long list of conditions that it puts on site plan review uh, permits, and the latest one that people might want to look at is the permit that went for um, 446 Main Street. But I think um, the planning board doesn't focus as much on behavior and um, controlling activity as the Zoning Board of Appeals does. It focuses more on um, the built environment, what the building is going to look like, how much parking there is, what the landscaping is. It's really uh, kind of an exterior um, view and you know, um, I think, you know, as, as Mr. Judge has said, the zoning board does focus more on um, how is the property going to be used and uh, is the use going to be appropriate and are there going to be nuisances and is there going to be, you know, are there going to be loud parties? The planning board wants to see a lease and they generally ask for a lease and then if they see something that um just you know that doesn't please them they'll ask for revisions and um often the leases that we get have provisions for you know no more than 10 people can can be in a particular unit at any one time and that kind of limits the number the number of people who can come to parties um but i think in general the zba has more experience with that and the planning board is as i said focused more on what does it look like is it too big for the neighborhood in terms of uh, you know how the building fits in with other buildings around it what's the architecture um so that's that's just my perception of how how things are different i don't want to dominate this um and, <laughs> and so i want to make sure that other people have a chance for questions if they have them or comments. Um, Mr. Sloviter. I'm, I had a question last time. Now I just have a quick comment. I think that a fairly and consistently applied scrutiny is an appropriate way to protect the community. It should not be short circuited or minimized. The current procedures seem to be working and I don't hear yet a compelling reason to make any significant changes. Thank you. One of the things I, I just wanna, I wanna highlight, uh, Councillor Haneke is, is 10.38. The, that is a section of the zoning bylaw that we really have to make our findings on. In order for, for a special permit to be granted, we have to make findings on 19 conditions, 19 findings, for 10 in 10.38. That sounds like a lot. They aren't always always applicable. Um, there's sometimes if you're not in floodplain, some of these don't apply, et cetera, et cetera. But there's they're they're pretty well thought out. They're pretty good. And I when I look at those findings, I can't imagine that I want to live in a home 
that doesn't meet those findings, whether they existed or not. I mean, those are these are principles that makes pretty good sense. And I wouldn't want to live in a neighborhood and live next to some a house that didn't also meet those findings. And I would so they're not the it's not the Bill of Rights, but it's a pretty good shot at what should be a good way of, of having a, a good standard for housing and things that we that the that a board should find. And so I'd encourage you again I, to take another look at 10.38. It really does provide for the a way in which the the board can make a decision. They can have a the, the community can be involved in that, which I think is an important part of of um, citing housing in the area that makes a lot of sense. It provides more support, and I think easier eases in for um, for developers and an appropriate development. But there are times when it just isn't appropriate, and there are times when even of use that is normally allowed in a district may not be appropriate in a on a specific lot it just may not be appropriate and we've had those where a converted dwelling could work out if it, it's permitted it could be there but it just wasn't going to work out for whatever reason sometimes it's safety sometimes it's it's um uh, it's not lot coverage so much but it could be drainage it could be a lot of different things and i think taking away the ability to make those decisions when that is necessary is really is, is is short circuiting something that I think the town has benefited from, quite frankly, rather than has been harmed by. And so that would be my comment. Is, is really the it's ten point three eight is a good guide. May oh, I? Please. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So if you live in a single family home, you live in a home that doesn't meet those findings potentially, because single family homes aren't required to go through the process and get a special permit or a site plan review. And so whether you rent or own a single family home, if you live in one, you don't meet those findings. Um, and my co-sponsor and I believe that it's not just people who are fortunate enough to have the economic ability to live in a single family home that should get the benefit of not needing to meet a lot of those findings that people that might not be able to afford to live in a single family home may also have a desire to be able to hold a kid's birthday party that has more than 10 kids present. But if a lease is required to limit in that rental, a gathering of no more than 10, they would be violating their lease if they invited 10 kids to a four year old's birthday party. Um, but your single family home doesn't have that requirement. And so one of the things we're trying to do is say a duplex, especially an owner occupied duplex and an affordable duplex are nearly identical to single family homes. They're not the same, I'll say that, but we don't require even a public hearing to build a single family home, no matter what you think it looks like, no matter how big or small it might be, no matter how many bedrooms it is, as long as it complies with the zoning bylaw on lot coverage dimension and everything else, you can build it and then you can have your gathering of more than 10. Or you can not have that barbecue that you just talked about, or you can have the deck or not have the deck. You can have your own parking plan without getting someone else's approval to do it because it meets the zoning bylaw. And part of our proposal is to say, Duplexes aren't that much different that they have to go through and meet all of those findings, especially the owner-occupied ones and the affordable ones. We admit that the non-owner-occupied ones need some level of review, which is why we've proposed moving them from special permit to site plan review. That there are findings and other things required and written decisions required for a planning board site plan review. But again, part of creating diverse neighborhoods and diversity of housing is allowing not just and eliminating single family only zoning is admitting that single families houses are not the only ones that should be treated special. And right now we treat them special by not requiring them ever to go through this process. And we're trying to say they're not the only ones that should be treated special. You know, I, I don't think anybody's arguing with you about owner occupied duplexes. I, I think you heard in the from owner occupied duplexes. I think most people here find that that's a pretty common way for people to 
move up to build equity. It's com it's it's pretty common in, in university towns, a lot of places, or ADUs. I don't think people are arguing with you about that. What we're saying is that there are times, especially with non-owner occupied duplexes, where you don't have the kind of concerns about the neighborhood when they are, especially when they're owned by out of state people or out of state institutions, they then there's a reason for the um, there's a reason for a greater oversight on, on the part of the community of, and the town over that. But I don't I don't think that you people are arguing with you about the about the owner occupied duplex. I I just didn't hear a lot of that from this from this group. And I've misinterpreted a lot of the people that have said that. The whole proposal is not good and won't do what well, we want. To no, do. no, no. So I apologize I, for that misinterpretation. No, then. No, no, no. I don't. And I misinterpreted I, your comments, um, Chair Judge, about not wanting to live next to a place or live in a place that doesn't have those findings, because an owner-occupied duplex we're proposing wouldn't necessarily need those findings. Well, I, I, but, but uh, owner, I, that's true. You're right. That was perhaps it was insensitive for me to not specify that. It could be uh, for the um, owner occupied duplex, but the fact of the matter is, is that I think those are very good conditions and I think they are very good conditions and very good findings that we need to make for most things. And if they're going to be non owner occupied in in the town, non owner occupied uh, or large, I think those kinds of findings ought to be made ought to be required. At some point, you got to draw the line, you know, you got to someplace at some place it's going to be impactful in other places. It's not going to be impactful. That's a judgment call. And that's a judgment the town council has to make. What we're doing here is giving you some feedback about what we think is the appropriate um, or what concerns we have. And in some cases, what we think is appropriate or not appropriate. And and I appreciate it. And my co-sponsor will when I share it with them where we yeah. we're not the, you're not the only board. We're, we've been I, no, I know you haven't. hearing from a lot and trying to to synthesize much sure. of it, some of which contradicts itself. So <laughs> that's um, what we're hearing, but we're all of it helps. That's that's a human condition, isn't it? Um, are, are there any other comments from members, Mr. Maxfield? Yeah, I just want to kind of echo just to make sure sure my uh, my position or, or just general opinion on this is clear. I uh, I love the idea of non owner or owner occupied duplexes. And triplex, even any anything where owner occupied is there or affordable uh, category is there to, to be able to be done with site plan review, but something like a, a, a triplex or even a, a uh, non owner occupied duplex, I don't necessarily have an objection, uh, or yeah, I should rather say I have a support. It's still coming to the CBA because it is something that you you know is. Uh, a profit-driven enterprise. This is somebody who's saying, you know, I'm, I'm coming here to make money. I'm not coming here to, to necessarily improve the community. You know, whatever is the cheapest way I can, can make money, I'll do it. And if the cheapest way involves them coming to the CBA and then having to meet certain conditions the neighborhood would want, I, I think that is something that is, is still very valuable. But if it's, if it's somebody who's like, hey, I'm trying to live in this community, why do I have to jump through all this red tape, uh, jump through all these hoops, cut through all this red tape just to, to be able to live somewhere where I can actually afford it? I, I think that is a very beneficial change. Um, Ms. Parks. I was just going to say, I feel like this town has an affordable housing crisis, and I feel like UMass has a student housing crisis, and it's come together so that Amherst has a housing crisis because of UMass's student housing crisis. And, you know, and it's made it so that Amherst is not really affordable anymore. If I sold my house, I wouldn't be able to move back here. Um, you know, it's, and my son, I have two sons who live in Northampton because it is cheaper in Northampton than it is in Amherst. And I, I wish that they could live here. That would make me happy. But so I, I, I'm actually, I, I agree with Dylan about owner occupied duplexes, you know, make that uh, uh, site plan review. But that what's happening, unfortunately, is that investors are buying up houses so that other people can't buy them. And that's also driving the prices higher because they, they know that they can get $1,000 per bedroom minimum. 
And so I wish that any of these things that you were doing would increase affordable housing. I wish we had a system in Amherst to make more affordable housing. And when I say affordable housing, I don't mean low income. I mean, housing that people can afford. Um, you know, we don't have that. And so I, I, I see that as, as a crisis in this town. I see that our general population is being reduced and it concerns me. And so I'll just say, you know, I, 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 I wish there was something that was, that was going to make the town easier for people to live here other than students. Um, Councilor Haneke, I, you've heard a lot from, from the various members on the board tonight that is critical of, of or questioning some of what you proposed. I want to make sure that you know that we are, we value the work that you did put into this and we respect the motivation for it. I think we all share, we all share a desire to have more affordable housing in town. We all share a desire to re reduce economic and social uh, segregation in town. De facto, we're real. We all want to get rid of, we all want to have the ability for people to build equity and grow. We all want those things. And we all, and at the same time, we want communities and neighborhoods that we're comfortable in, where, we, where their kids can grow up, where they can go to school. We want all those things. And I think we share that. We, have a, we may have different ideas about how to get there and what's the best way to do it. But in this case, I really, I really do believe that the process that we have for most, for anything contentious, really helps to work out and, and resolve problems rather than, rather than uh, makes, the, makes it worse. I don't think it adds that. I don't think it adds that much cost. It may add in, in one case. Um, I've heard people talk about, but I don't think it adds that much cost. And I certainly don't think that it is a reason. That, and I don't think that eliminating it is going to reduce the cost of housing anything but by the most marginal amount, the most marginal amount. And I think it actually will increase the house, increase cost of housing, because I think you will find in, uh, institutional investors will move quickly into moderately priced homes where they see that they can they can make it a non owner occupied duplex through a a more an easier an easier regulatory process or even a tri trip triplex that raises the cost of that house that makes the puts it out of the out of the market out of the the um the ability of working families to afford that it raises the price every place and i think it really ends up this case it ends up costing us uh, creating more costly housing rather than reducing the, the cost of housing we have a real i mean i i spent 14 years working on, on housing policy in the u.s congress when i was a kid and that was a long time ago but houses still there's a couple of things that are really true number one we have a tremendous demand that's not met a lot of that excess demand is students we have a tremendous amount we have a, a and a, a wonderful institution that doesn't house them. And so then it clip, comes on the town to do that. That increase, we don't have the supply and this isn't gonna increase supply. We have to look at other things to do. This, pro, this proposal isn't gonna increase supply. We're gonna have to find other ways to do that. There are some good things here, I think, on the owner-occupied duplexes, but I really, I, I have some problems with, the, with other parts of it. And, and, um, and I just wanted to make sure that you understood what that is. It gave an opportunity for the members of the board to, to express that as well. And, um, and I hope that as this process moves through, you'll we will continue to have a, 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 a um, conversation about how we can increase housing. No, I, I, I respect that. My co-sponsor and I knew that we would start conversations and that not everyone would agree and but we need to have the conversations right and so um, this has been lively it's it's been appreciated. Um, I, I hope you know throughout town we can continue these conversations and I do want to say that um, my co-sponsor and I Pat and I know that this is not the only solution right like this is not going to solve anything there. We have to take a multifaceted approach, a multi-pronged approach to addressing our housing crisis. This is just one thing we saw we could propose that could help, which is why I've always said, we hope it would help, right? Um, 
and and there's other things we need to be doing too. Um, and so I I certainly appreciate the conversation we've had, all of the comments that have been um, given to us, critical or not. You know, we we know um, we're supportive. We 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 know we knew we were we were going to create a, a lively conversation among many people uh, with this proposal, and 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 that's always worthwhile. Um, we have intended to have public comment, um, but I know that I, you've already had one meeting. You may, I don't know if you're going to stay for it or not. That's up to you. Um, but you've had a lot of, you've probably had several meetings today already. So, um, and you, you, I and have you ought to be able to go, <laughs> you ought to be able to go home and have a, um, have your dinner, but, um, we're going to have some public comment and, um, you're welcome. You're more than welcome to stay for that if you wish. But I want to get. I will stay, but I will turn off my camera because it's a, because I'm a guest. But I will stay at least through the public comment. Absolutely, um, and if there's any other com uh, kind of wrap up comments from members, um, I, this is the time to do it before we go to public comment. Mr. Maxfield, I just want to say thanks a lot for for coming down here and talking to us today. Uh, really appreciate it, and I really appreciate your. Uh, your hard work on this proposal and your hard work you've done for the town. So thank you very much for coming on down. Great. All right. Um, Stephen, uh, it looks like we have, I see one hand up and Alex Kent. Can we bring them in? Uh, hello, my name is Alex Kent. And I live at 83 North Prospect Street with my wife, Felicia Savine. I'd like to start by- Great. And, and Mr. Kent, just a second, just take a, have about three minutes to your, I didn't introduce the restrictions, but have about three minutes to your comment, if you would. Yes, I'm aware. Uh, I appreciate the questions from the members of the board. I think they were on point and spoke for many of the concerns that my wife and I have about this proposed change. Um, it seems to me that it, I, I agree if the goal of this change is to encourage the creation, the construction of more affordable housing in the town of Amherst, if that, and that if that includes infill, that's something that we wholeheartedly support. On the other hand, if the change makes it in any way easier for investors to purchase and convert single family houses duplexes or triplexes into student housing, which they will not occupy, we are vigorously opposed to any such change. The requirement that these properties go before the ZBA and go through the special permit process is a reasonable check on these sorts of activities. We live on a street that is increasingly occupied by uh, undergraduate students, it is ruining the quality of our lives, and there is nothing, it seems, that can stop it. There is a duplex just to the south of our home. It has been recently purchased by investors from Brooklyn, New York, who have no intention of living in the town of Amherst, who have no intention of abiding by the four, uh, uh, four unrelated persons cap on rental properties who have every intention of putting as many undergraduates into that property as possible. These sorts of outside investors, the, the type of mom and pop investors that were mentioned in the conversation need to be stopped. Their activities do not need to be encouraged. There should be nothing that would make the process easier for them to purchase properties like this and continue to destroy the quality of our neighborhood. I appreciate very much the work done by the members of the ZBA to uh, call into question the motivations of this proposed change, and we are opposed to the change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kent. Um, I see Dorothy, Pam, Commissioner, uh, Councillor Pam has her hand up. Please give us your uh, name and address and um... 229 Amity Street. Um, I also would like to applaud the uh, work and the discussion of the zoning board today. Uh, I think that you um, gave a, a full and thorough discussion and it was it was very good. Um, I had a lot of things to say, but I just thought I'd pass on something that uh, 
uh, I guess it was Kittle, Kitty Axelson Barry sent, listened to uh, Mayor Wu's State of the City speech and said there's some great vocabulary in there. And uh, here's one, need to focus on building community, not just buildings. I, I think that's something that we've really been talking about. Our, our residential neighborhoods are communities, and we certainly don't have any problem of having some students join us in our community. But we want it to stay a community where people can talk with each other and work and entertain and have fun together. Um, she said the need to benefit all of our communities, the need to plan for community stability. You hear a lot of fear about the community becoming unstable and flipping. And certainly the worry about the new development proposed in the middle of a residential block on 98 Fearing Street is a, was worse than we thought. We thought we, we originally told that this density would be at corners and at intersections. And that's not true anymore. So uh, the plan is really kind of like aiming at the heart of the community. Need to plan for sustainability. Um, that means in keeping, keeping grass and trees. Um, so that's what some of the words it said, and the urgent need for resiliency, affordability, and equity. And we're all concerned about the fact that young families and people who work at the university can't afford to um, buy a home, let alone rent a home in a neighborhood where you would like to raise a family. So um, I, I think that we have to um, really think about limits. What I'm, my feeling is owner occupied uh, duplexes, great. We have that. They fit in the neighborhood. Um, I wish that more of us could afford to do the accessory dwellings, which we're allowed to do now. But building costs for the individual person are so high, which is why we're kind of wide open for the out-of-town investors. They have very big, deep, deep pockets. And if we're not careful, that will kind of destroy the neighborhood. We need to maintain some year-round people. Our taxes are supporting the town. We have high taxes. Our taxes are going up. And we're going to be asked to, in, to vote to increase them further. And people are saying to me, uh, it's like a tax rebellion is going on. They're saying, we pay the taxes. We haven't complained. But now it seems that nobody cares about us and nobody is listening to us. So I think those are important things to think about. And um, I'll leave you with the last phrase that I gave started with that uh, focus on building community, not just buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pam. Um, I see that Jane, is it Keller or Janet Keller has got her hand up? Is that okay? I try to sound. Yep. Um, J Janet, um, please give us your name, address, and keep your um, comments to about three minutes, if you would. Thank you. Janet Keller, uh, 120 Pulpit Hill Road in beautiful North Amherst. Um, and uh, I, uh, for many years, was the chief of Stratanic strategic planning and policy um, for the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. And I've been a founding member of several organizations that have provided community um, and provided housing and built and created community uh, at the same time. I um, heard uh, several people say, we wish we had a way to supply more affordable housing and more diverse housing. And um, that has been something I've worked hard on as well. Um, and we do have ways to uh, provide such housing. Um, and I, uh, two of them are zoning related. Um, developers can do this through the inclusionary zoning that was adopted um, and um, uh, also through 40B reviews, um, uh, provisions um, that are reviewed by the ZBA. Um, um, so um, I counted, um, I just did a quick count of some recent ones and came up with 176 affordable units that are at, actually built or in the pipeline built, built by developers um, with occlusionary zoning or, or will be built with it or 40B. And then there's also the nonprofit sector, um, which I've worked with. 
and um, the public uh, donor um, and public and donor funded units um, like the ones that the Municipal Housing Trust has um, uh, put forth and Valley CDC and um, folks like Amherst Community Land Trust are providing. And so I, I think that um, there are ways and, um, and I 100% agree that um, the kind of review that the ZBA provides is critical for people to be able to have the quiet enjoyment of their home, to be not worried uh, to bits about uh, the declining value of their home when they're surrounded by noisy neighbors. Um, and uh, I, um, my final thing is to put in a plea that we um, retain a butters notices, that we do not get rid of a butters notices because um, it's critical that people um, can um, comment on um, new, new developments that are coming uh, to their neighborhoods um, and people should not be deprived of that right. Thanks a lot for all the work you do, um, which is very impressive, and for the opportunity to comment. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Keller. Um, Rani Parker, and please help me if I've mispronounced your first name, but repeat it. Give us the uh, um, your address and keep it to about three minutes if you could. Yeah, so I've been called worse, but it's actually Ronnie. Um, Ronnie, okay, uh, Ronnie I'm sorry. Ronnie Parker on North Prospect Street. Um, I have the feeling that this is really important, but I'm having a very hard time understanding the scope of the changes that are recommended. And when I saw the paragraph in the agenda, I was really glad I was coming to hear Councillor Haneke explain it herself, because that paragraph I had to read twice to conclude that I had to take notes to understand what was there. And in fact, I still feel a little overwhelmed by all these complexities. And I think that this kind of treatment of the subject matter in and of itself is a problem because citizens cannot, cannot understand what's being decided when something important is being decided. So I did get out of today that, um, the problem that this is trying to address is the high prices of homes and the lack of sufficient stock of homes. And the solution is to facilitate more building by uh, fixing the process of approval for building. And the fix is essentially moving it out of a process of engagement between a board such as yourself and the parties involved, replacing that with one person a commissioner who's going to say yes or no. So I could be wrong there, but I think the real problem with that approach is that it prevents or loses the opportunity for people to build trust with each other. And I see that there's, from having lived here just over a year, I'm learning about lack of trust. Um, and in this community, I think it's really important. And when I hear you talk about how you work with um, two parties that are in disagreement and help them come to resolution, I just, I feel that's so very important. I would not give that up uh, for, for any speedy building. Buildings, once they're done, are there for generations. So I don't, I'm wary of rushing about things that are permanent. And the second thing I wanted to say is really, um, one was the trust issue that we need trust. So processes that allow people or even require people to engage with each other are important. And the second one being this whole question of abutters. It's unimaginable to me that abutters don't matter. How is that even possible? Um, I think that people, who are near some change that's going to happen are in the best position to predict the outcome of that action. And 
especially when I hear that, oh, we don't know what the impact of this is going to be. It's really scary because the people will, who will know the impact of what of a of a structure rising up next to them are the people who live right there. So I think excluding people in general in the interests of speed in this instance uh, is probably a mistake, but I look I thank you for the discussion and I look forward to reading more and understanding more and participating in more of the discussion myself. I do believe that the problem that had instigated this, um, uh, this proposal is important and needs to be addressed, which is more, more su sustainable environment, more affordable housing, more diverse, more people friendly um, and environmentally sensitive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Janet Keller already spoke. Alex Kent already spoke. So I see no new comment, new, no new hands. Um, is there any response to any public comment from board members? All right. Um, given that, um, I think we're completed our consideration for tonight of the, the zoning proposal. Um, the next order of business is public comment on any matter that is not before the board tonight. Um, and so we'll open it up to public comment on anything other than the zoning proposal. And I don't see any hands up. Great. All right. Uh, there's, there's no other business. Is there, is there any new business, any business from the members to bring up? Uh, we have a, I guess, Chris, could we just go through this, what we have for the next uh, the meeting schedule for the next couple of, for the next month? When is our next meeting? And then we have the meeting on the 23rd. So we have a meeting on. You have a meeting on March 9th. Yep. And what's and on that the agenda for that? On March 9th, you'll take up those West Street projects where we had a problem with the public notice back in sure. um, early February, I think. Anyway, we are um, making sure that the, the legal ad was sent in today. We're going to send out a butters notices and post the public hearing. And the West Street projects are projects for which you've already received a packet and a uh, project application report. We'll make sure that you get that again but you did have an opportunity to become familiar. It's two duplexes, one um, that already exists and some property is being taken away from that one to add to a second property that will that is requesting to become a duplex. Um, and, and those properties are going to be managed by Alan St. Hilaire, and I think you're familiar with him. Um, the next one is March 23rd. And that's the meeting that Mr. Judge is not able to attend. And um, so far we have Canton Ave, which is the one that I described to you before. It's a public hearing about moving a house and um, there may be one or two other changes to the plot, to the site plan that are being proposed there. Um, the next date that you have for a meeting is April 13th. And Originally, we had um, scheduled the spoke, and actually, it's called live at the spoke. And what this is is it's a um, you probably know what the spoke is. It's a nightclub that is um, along East Pleasant Street, and it takes up a building that used to have a copy shop and a pizza shop as well as the spoke. Anyway, that the owner of that uh, business is proposing to um, open a nightclub in the building that was occupied by Old Town Tavern. And um, so he's proposing this under the new bylaw. And this is a special permit um, that comes to the Zoning Board of Appeals for this new nightclub. Um, so that was um, proposed to be heard on April 13th. And now we also need to find um, a date for 515 Sunderland Road. And um, <clears throat> We had thought that would go on March 23rd, but that won't be able to go then uh, because Mr. Judge will not be here. So um, we could put that on April 13th with the spoke, but that might be 
really overloading uh, that night. And then next possible night would be April 27th. So. Um, well, we'll give, well, that's, we've got, and, and I know we have kind of things, uh, we have applications sort of in the waiting room. We do room have applications are, in the, yes, in the waiting In the waiting room, room that are, uh, you and I have talked about them and I, I'm impressed. Yeah. That we have a lot of work to do um, in the next few months. There's a lot of things that are waiting, almost ready to drop. So, um, we're would you be, be willing to add a meeting um, in order to accommodate both the spoke and 515 Sunderland Road? Like, I don't know when Mr. Judge is coming back from his vacation, but um... I, I would just be gone for the for a few days. I, I've got some. I've got some. Um, you know. We could add a meeting. I don't know if people have the ability to do that. I know that Dylan has another board that you serve on. We can we can flip with that at times. But is that a Thursday night board, Dylan? Uh, it is. Um, Thursday night it's board. Thursday night, but we 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 had one tonight before this meeting. Now uh, Steve had been um, on that board with me, and now that he's here with the CBA. I don't. I don't even have to think about conflicts anymore. Steve. Steve lets me know when there is one because it's the same <laughs> conflict for him now too. Yeah, uh, McCarthy's doing two things, right? Yeah. Yep. Between okay. um, between the March twenty third date and the April thirteenth date, we have two Thursdays. One is Thursday, March thirtieth, and the other one is Thursday, April sixth, and. Um, April 6th is better for me. Um, the 30th, I do not anticipate being here on that on the 30th. So we could schedule um, the 515 Sunderland Road for Thursday, April 6th. Are people available for that night? I'm seeing people yep. nodding. So far I am. So Steve is available and Tammy and Dylan. And what about Craig? Can't hear you. He's got my earphones. That's the trouble. <laughs> you got my earphones. Let me take them out. Wait a minute. Uh, not loud. Give us a yes or a no. Can you thumbs up for the, or do you not? Okay. So Craig is available for the sixth. And what about John? Yeah, my schedule seems to be available for the evening of the sixth. So all of you are available for the sixth. So we could, one, two, three, four, five. We could have 515 Sunderland Road on um, April 6th. Yep. Okay. All right. Let's do that. Okay. So then we have the 23rd with, um, with Can't Dylan, with chair, right? Dylan chair. Yep. yep. On the 23rd. And then, um, on the 9th, we have a, a regular meeting. On the 9th, you have the West street. Yep. And then okay. on the April 6th, you have 515 Sunderland road and April 13th, you have the spoke. Okay. That sounds right. great. I hope the planning board doesn't get any applications. It's <laughs> really a busy time. Oh, well, I do want to, it's important to know that you guys are um, working double time and filling several jobs. And we appreciate how difficult that is. You're doing a great job. Um, and we appreciate, I just want you to know, I think it's, it's, I can speak for the board. We appreciate the work you are doing Chris and Stephen and Steve. Yep. Thank you very it's, much. We it's, it, it's appreciate your on. appreciation. <laughs> a lot going on. Thank you. Mr. Chair, real quick, yes. um, as Mr. we're Joe. sort of projecting out, was that um, March 23rd, Thursday, March 23rd, that I think we had just referenced there? Yes. Yeah. I will be out of the area. I will not be able to attend that meeting. Look at my calendar. That one does not work for me. March 23rd. So we'll need a, a fifth Future person for March 23rd. Are other people available March 23rd? 
So we'll work on we'll work on the associates. Chris, you and I will talk about how we make sure everybody gets a chance to to serve because we'll need two associates for the twenty third. Mm -hmm. Because I won't be able to serve and Mr. Gilbert won't be able to serve on March 23rd. But Craig is up or down for the 23rd? Craig is up, I think. Craig is gone. <laughs> Craig is gone. <laughs> well, we will I'll get... send him an email. You send him an email. You and I will talk about how we want to make sure we, we can give all, the, all, the associate members a chance to serve. So mm -hmm. you, let's you and I talk about how we assign that. Okay, and what did Dylan say about the 23rd? Is Dylan available? Yep, yep that works chair. for me. On the 23rd, you're going to chair, right? Yep. yep. Oh, that's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. And now Mr. Meadows is back. You can save yourself an email. Chris. Oh, Mr. Meadows. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> on the 23rd, I, I are you available on the 23rd of March? Yes. Okay. And what I was saying about uh early april is i'm i'm going to be in colombia but i've taken meetings there before so i can do it again okay oh okay Good. all right all right so i need Ms. to Park. talk to steve about associates i just gonna say if there's going to be any site visits if we could find out ahead of time because i i work full time and have to i have to arrange around those so mm -hmm. if any are required let let us know it, it's, has it worked out pretty well for everybody to have those eight o'clock straightforward that don't do them at eight and then be done? Um, even if we have to do two of them, two different days, but do them at eight. Does that work for people? It works for me, but I'm not working, so I'm an early morning riser. Okay. Okay. Good. Eight, eight usually works for me. Good. Very good. All right. Great. Okay. Um, any other new business? Good. All right. I'd entertain a motion that we adjourn. So moved. Oh, moved. oh we, <laughs> we, we, we got two of them. All right. We got a motion and a second. I heard them both. Tammy uh, moved and who seconded? Oh, Craig. Mr. Max, Maxfield moved, Hart seconded. It's Maxfield and Craig. Yeah. And, I, but, and Craig came in a little late. I, he didn't hit the buzzer on time like everybody oh, else. Too Just bad. missed the buzzer. <laughs> All right. Okay. The, the motion is not debatable. Um, chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. Uh, we have a unanimous vote. Um, five votes for the motion passes. We are adjourned. 827. Thank you. Welcome aboard, Mr. Slavater. Well, Thank you very much. Thank you. Serving. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for your commitment to the town. And we'll see all of you soon, uh, I guess. All right. Thanks for your Thank comments. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, bye.